Good evening all. Um, can I welcome you to this meeting of the scrutiny panel, unusually on a Friday, uh, but unfortunately it had to be shoehorned in uh, sometime this week to make a, meet a, a 10 day notice. No practicing evacuations planned for this evening, so if the alarm sounds, it's for real and we know the way out. Uh, the meeting is being broadcast live over the internet on the Council's YouTube channel and will be available to watch afterwards. Discreet use of mobile phones and other devices is welcomed, requested to set them to silent and not use camera flash. Uh, we'll break at 7.30, subject to the progress of business. Uh, I'm Dennis Willits, Councillor for Lexton and Bracewick Ward. Um, Good evening, Darius Laws, Rural North Ward. Paul Smith, St Anton, St John's Ward. Uh, Councillor Sam McCarthy representing Shrub End Ward. Mike Lilly, <laughs> excuse me, Old Heath, the Hive and Rowhedge Ward. Lee Scordis, Old Heath, Hive and Rowhedge. Uh, Councillor Sue Lissy Moore and Pridgegate Ward. Owen Howell, Democratic Services Officer. Richard Block, Chief Operating Officer. And we have Councillor Tim Young in the public gallery, so that covers, uh, covers everyone. Uh, substitutions, as far as I'm aware, there are no substitutions. Urgent items, none to report. Declarations of interest. Uh, minutes, there are no minutes to approve at this meeting. Uh, General, have your say. There was one registered speaker who has now withdrawn. Uh, decisions taken under special urgency provisions, uh, no such decisions, which brings us on to the main item of this evening, item eight, cabinet or portfolio holder decisions called in for review. Uh, and the item called in is review of the Saturday household drop-off service. Uh, Perhaps it's just worth remembering that all day-to-day -day decisions of the, uh, the council are by law delegated to the leader uh, and the cabinet. Uh, and the scrutiny panel's job uh, is to see that all those decisions comply with the strategic plan uh, and the budget, which has been approved by council. Uh, and uh, more of concern this evening, uh, all decisions of the council cabinet panels committees and those under delegated powers should have regard um, to the principles of good decision-making uh, which are set out in the constitution. Uh, the function of the panel is not to determine whether the cabinet decision we're looking at this evening was right or wrong, but whether it was properly taken uh, by the, uh, the portfolio holder. So under the have your say, uh, section members of the public and I don't see any this evening we have a visiting councillor may address the, uh, the scrutiny panel on any matter that they wish uh, but when we get to the formal deliberations of the panel uh, we need to strictly confine ourselves to the specific issues raised by the spokesman uh, for the five councillors who called in this decision and which were acknowledged by the monitoring officer as valid reasons uh, for a call in. Uh, the general running order is the usual one for, uh, for call-ins. We haven't had one for a long time, so I'll just remind you of what we do. Uh, have your say by members of the public and by visiting councillors. Um, Councillor Lissimore will then present her call-in. Councillor Goss uh, remotely um, over the IT system uh, um, as portfolio holder for neighbourhood services and waste will respond and explain. Uh, we then put questions to principally to Councillor Goss for clarification, but to Councillor Lissimore also, if that's appropriate. The panel will then um, discuss what we've heard uh, and make recommendations as to whether the decision was taken in the um, in consistently with the uh, the Constitution's recommendations for uh, uh, for for good decisions. Uh, the issues that the, the uh, monitoring officer has agreed uh, are valid for this evening's call in uh, concern consultation with residents, consultation with staff, possibility increase of fly tipping, um, the effect on the most vulnerable, uh, the implications on the council's climate policy uh, and um, uh, impact on the domestic waste collection service. When we've heard all that, we then um, we then deliberate on whether the decision was 
written correctly. And we have a choice of three uh, possibilities, uh, which we'll come back to later on, but those are either to confirm the decision that the portfolio holder did everything correctly in the way he took the decision, uh, or we can refer it back to the decision taker, further consideration, uh, or uh, if it's particularly serious, we can refer the decision to full counsel. Um, but those have to be really, really important decisions. So that's the process. Is everyone happy with um, with the way we're we're hearing it? Is there any dissension? We sort out the procedures before we start. So first of all, <clears throat> have your say, speakers, on this issue. Councillor Young, you wish to address the the panel. Thank you, Chair. Uh, if I can point out that I am here in my role as Ward Councillor for Greenstead and no other role that I have on the Council. Um, yes, when um, I think the first time I saw this decision was when it came through on the Council's email system and uh, it came as a bit of a surprise to me. Um, if you look at Councillor Lissamore's reasons for uh, calling it in, uh, the six bullet points, I think they're unarguable. Um, definitely all these things either didn't happen or will happen. I would say there was no consultation with residents or ward councillors on behalf of residents. So it is um, disappointing. I mean, you can lay the blame where you like, I guess, in terms of why the decision was made, but surely all these things should have been taken into account and some uh, consultation should have been made with staff and residents or, or ward councillors affected. So um, given that, and I just want to colour in, I, I hope for uh, the scrutiny panel's help, uh, a bit of colour around Greenstead Ward. Greenstead Ward has had this service or something akin to this service for as long as I've been a councillor there, which is 31 years. And before that, we used to have freighters on a Saturday, we used to come and pick up bulky items in particular. Uh, that was in place when I first got elected in 1992, it had been in place for a while then. Of course, people from miles around used to come and get rid of their rubbish as well. So it wasn't just for Greenstead residents. So that was taken into account. And then what happened was this bookable collection service came in, which has been working really well. I think it was extended. Uh, and for all the reasons in Councillor Lissimore's uh, call-in, um, was a good service and I think a green service uh, because you know the council can dispose of bulky items and other items in a way that um, is acceptable. Whereas I think undoubtedly it would increase fly tipping if, if, if this didn't happen. Now I could understand the reasons that Councillor Goss may have made the decision for budget reasons or other reasons, but I don't think he did follow due process in that there should have been uh, consultation and did he take into account all these other factors that uh, may well I think will happen uh, if this decision uh, so you know there might be a, a compromise that he can make but I do think it's worth him taking another look at the decision in light of these reasons uh, and others it might be that we could be a, a more limited a version of the service that could be brought in I hope he would be prepared to look at that I was disappointed to read in 4.5 that he didn't consider mediation with yourself and uh, council is to be necessary. Uh, I'd like to hear an explanation as to why that was the case, because, you know, so often these things can be managed without having to go to the expense and the time of having a formal scrutiny panel meeting. But no, I think um, council is uh, has got good reasons for calling in this decision. And I would hope the scrutiny panel would uh, look on it with, with favour and perhaps we can come as so often in politics to a compromise decision where Councillor Goss can save some money, get a more streamlined service, but still have a service that's valuable to many residents, including uh, those of my ward. Thank you, Tim. Uh, I certainly sympathise with uh, your analysis of the impact on wards. I think we all all feel that. But of course, that is not the issue that we're discussing this, this evening. It's uh, um, the, the, the decision is for the portfolio holder. The way the decision is taken is for the constitution and for, for us to uphold. But thank you for your, your, your presentation. There are no other 
have your say, speakers that I can see from, from here. So we, we move on to Councillor Lismore. Could you formally present your reasons for, um, for calling in uh, this particular decision? Um, thank you very much, um, Councillor Willits, and, and thank you all for being here tonight. I do appreciate it, particularly being on a, on a Friday night. Um, and it is a shame that we are well, here. And I too, like Councillor Tim Young, would like to know why Councillor Goss um, did not agree to mediation because it, it may be that we didn't need to be here tonight, um, but we are, and I appreciate the opportunity um, to discuss this issue. None of us will forget that, that these times financially are very, very hard. We know that. I was the cabinet member for finance last year. And I witnessed how difficult it is to balance the books. I've been there, but, and it is a big but, as it is why we are here tonight, it is wrong to abolish schemes when no one, including staff and operatives and residents have not been consulted. Removing this scheme hits those that are most vulnerable particularly those residents that are isolated on our larger housing estates and villages and do not, who do not have access to a vehicle. Imagine you live in the heart of Greenstead or Beerchurch or Rowhedge or 8 Ash Green. You have excess waste as you've tidied up your house. It won't go out with your curbside rubbish and you have no vehicle. How are you going to get rid of that rubbish? You can't go to the Essex County Council recycling site. You can't afford to get a licensed waste removal. So you dump it illegally in the alley around the corner at the back. Or you pay your mate a few quid and he dumps it in a country lane. Most importantly, you have not asked this demographic of resident what they now will do. You haven't asked your officers what impact they think it would have in alleyways in Greenstead or Beer Church, or Eight Ash Green. The household drop-off service operated over 24 weekends of 45 locations last year, 45 locations. If you looked at the audience for each of those 45 locations, that's a lot of residents. The average lows for residents raised were nearly five tonnes each weekend. Now, where now is that five tonnes going to go? In their black sacks, in an alleyway, in a country lane, to the Essex County Council recycling site, putting more strain on the road network when, by announcing a climate emergency, we as a council should be promoting less car journeys, not more. When we were in charge last year, we actually increased this service and we recognised how well it is being used. And, I hear you cry, where will the savings be otherwise made? After being the cabinet member for finance, I know that £25,000 savings is a relatively small amount for this council. You are not talking about hundreds of thousands of pounds savings. My concern is by saving £25,000, you are adding pressure onto existing services. You will have to add more collections to the curbside routes. You will have to clear up more fly tipping. And whilst it is not your budget, Essex County Council will have more visits to the recycling site, adding to their costs. So I'm asking you to leave the schedule in place. Wait until you assess the impact of charging for garden waste schemes, which of course we are against as well. But consult residents, consult parish councils, consult your own officers to see what they believe the impact will be. This scheme reduces fly tipping. This scheme is well used. Do not scrap the scheme until you know the real cost. Thank you, Councillor Simore. You strayed just a little into the politics rather than staying on the, uh, uh, on the decision itself, but uh, I think it was reasonably supportive of, uh, uh, of the uh, six points that you had made. So I, I didn't stop you and we'll allow the same latitude to Councillor Goss. Uh, when he uh, he presents, which he will do now. Is he on the... So, Chair, the oh, so, Chair I, I have a question sorry, for the uh, councillor. Um, okay, can, is it procedural uh, or do we wait until Councillor Goss has presented? Because he may well answer the question that you uh, 
Who are going to ask? I'm certain you will. Oh, well, in that case, carry on then, yeah. Councillor Smith. Right. Um, I was interested in what you're saying about the procedure. Uh, could you tell me, because um, I understand um, Essex County Council has recently made changes to the um, service at the tip and that they'll be having to book it. Um, how did they go through these points? Um, can, can I stop at that point? Uh, we are scrutinising a decision by uh, Colchester City uh, and um, uh, I, I know Council, Council Lissimore referred to the impact on the County Council, but if, if you want to know that answer, you must go along to the scrutiny panel at, uh, at, at Essex. Uh, uh, you may be happy to answer it, Council Lissimore. Um, it, it's, it's not germane to the, uh, unless Councillor Goss tells it is, it is, it's not germane to the way this de decision is made. It's certainly an issue, I mean, I agree entirely with Councillor Smith, it is an issue, um, but what another council is doing um, it, it is not um, linked closely with the way the decision is made. Uh, sorry, Chair. I mean, I'm I'm trying to understand how a council should do things. I've quoted an example of another council, and I'd like to see how they did this to compare it, because you know, th that's why I ask that question. So, so, you know, what consultation did they do with residents, with staff? Will it increase fly tipping? Well, yes, it will. Um, you know, will it affect the most vulnerable? No, it won't. But the question there could well be on computer access because you have to book online, for example. So I would be interested if we're trying to judge whether this council followed the correct procedure. I'd like to hear an example of another council in a very similar situation as to whether they did things entirely differently, because if they did, then it would strengthen the case. If they didn't, then... Chairman, I, I know this is a separate council. That is a separate, completely separate um, issue, but I would be very happy because I actually know what has happened at Essex, the consultation that they've actually taken place. And it would be actually very, very good for Colchester City Council to look at what Essex have done before they introduced this scheme throughout the whole of Essex to show the, the full consultation that they did, particularly at the Rayleigh site, mm -hmm. to find out how a booking system worked, the impact that it had on both officers and residents, and how they then made a decision from the evidence that they got, because there was a full consultation and there has been a trial of the system. And that is the argument here, that there has been no trial. There has been no assessment. No resident or officer has been asked of the impact. So I, I cannot, I've now answered that question in that, yes, please, Councillor Smith, go and look at what has happened at Rayleigh over the last year and look at the statistics and the information that they got from there and how they then implemented them, looked at them, analysed them to then bring it out throughout the whole of Essex. That's actually how you do a change, OK? At Colchester City Council have not done that. I, I, I'm happy for Councillor Lissimore to give her view as a, a city councillor on what has happened. Uh, I, I'm just a little worried about Councillor Lissimore um, giving her opinion, as well as calling it in, giving her opinion as the county councillor with responsibility for it. If that is to be done, then I think we have to uh, we have to have a, a separate hat exercise. And Councillor Lissimore has not been invited here this evening to give the county council's view. A fair question to Councillor Goss, of course, would be, did he discuss the, the impact of this with neighbouring authorities? Because it is his duty to get the decision right. It's not Councillor Lissimore's duty within the city council to get the decision right. Um, now, you may say that's splitting splitting hairs, and there is an easier way to get to the, the answer, but unfortunately the scrutiny panel has rules, and uh, the, the rule is Councillor Lissimore uh, has, has called in the matter as a city councillor. Uh, councillor Goss will then explain how he took the decision, and if he wishes to explain um, what uh, what consultation he had with Essex County Council, he's welcome to do so. And you can ask him that question by all means, and he will answer authoritatively uh, as the, uh, the portfolio holder. 
but um, I, I don't want to stray into the area where we start uh, in this particular forum scrutinizing um, county council. I accept your ruling chair, although I don't necessarily agree with it. It's certainly disappointing that I've asked the question, Council Lismore is prepared to answer it, but I accept your yeah, our county councillor, she can answer it as a county councillor, uh, but we're not, we haven't, we're not asking questions of Councillor council Lismore as a county councillor. Now, you, know, you, you may think this is uh, sort of procedurally daft, I think it's probably procedurally daft, uh, but we, we have a narrow context for the way uh, we, we ask these decisions. We're not scrutinizing whether the decision was right or wrong, which is what we're, we're, we're going to get into very easily. We're scrutinizing whether the decision was taken correctly. And the issue of whether Councillor Goss um, took advice, asked questions, consulted with other people, is at the heart of um, the way the decision was taken. So these questions must be put to him rather than to Councillor Lissimore. Can we then move over to Councillor Goss and uh, he can explain how the decision was taken and he can explain um, what uh, consultation was carried out with the County Council, if any. Uh, he speaks with the authority of the portfolio holder who within this administration and authority uh, has the power to, uh, to take these decisions and we just wish to know how it was done. So Councillor Goss, the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you very much for a very interesting debate so far. So let me answer um, the points raised. The County Council were sent this proposal. Um, it was done at officer level and it was um, submitted for comment. We didn't receive any comments back and we did chase several times at officer level, senior officer level, I'll add. I'm not going to name officer names. I don't think it's appropriate but we got no feedback. So we got no feedback or comments or concerns raised about this actual proposal. So we were indeed consulted on this decision, or at least um, we asked for their feedback before any decision was made and we received that. And hopefully that closes that point off. In terms of staff, um, in the initial uh, report or response, you will note, uh, or certainly I can tell you that because this is funded purely on overtime, we actually struggle to get staff to crew out um, the vehicles. So we have to use agency staff. So although um, we say we haven't consulted staff, we actually struggle to get staff to actually run the service. So we are increasing the cost of it by using agency staff. Now, why did I take this decision? Uh, light has been discussed. We have just passed a budget on February the 15th, I believe it was. And in that were cost savings. In there was garden waste charging. And therefore, decisions had to be taken. Some extremely difficult. In fact, all decisions are difficult. We've um, obviously removed the Highway Ranger service because Essex stopped funding it. Um, this is um, another set of decisions that have had to be taken and it's also entwined with another decision that wasn't called in which delivers £60,000 worth of savings across the service all from the overtime budget and strategically in the overtime uh, budget and in terms of the budget there is no budget for overtime we are um, removing that that's one of the budget cost savings and therefore there is no budget to deliver the service. And this is one of the decisions. Now, this was included in budget proposals that were circulated, um, and therefore it, um, you know, was one of a number of options that was looked at, uh, along with, you know, there were other cuts as well. Um, and this was, uh, you know, one of those that has been decided upon, regrettably. In terms of the uh, population, the reason uh, I didn't believe that consultation was necessary because if you look at the percentage of Colchester that use the service, it's less than 1%. It's 120 people um, that use it. We're a, we're a population of 193,000. You can do the maths on that. Uh, and if you judge on the feedback when this was actually put on the Gazette website that it was cancelled and went on social media, we don't 
budget comments were people didn't even know that service, so didn't even use it. So the vast majority of people use the correct measures that are in place to actually remove their garden waste. Every household, apart from if you live in a flat, but if you live in a flat, uh, it's unlikely that you're going to have a garden because it's probably communal and therefore managed by the managing agent. Everyone has access to the garden collection service. And therefore, everyone does have a way from the doorstep to remove the majority of their garden waste every fortnight, currently free of charge in this city. So that is a good example why the uptake of those uh, weekend services is not high in terms of the time collected compared to what we collect every day that we run the garden service. So if you compare those figures um, in comparison in tonnage, um, you know, the, the lorries can hold around about 10 tonnes. So you can then see that we're only filling, um, we're not filling the lorries, you know, anywhere near. So if you take the household waste, it's 1.08 tonnes um, for garden. So that's potentially one tenth of a lorry. So we're sending out a lorry. We talk about the environment. We're sending out although they are you know as clean as they can be we're sending out a lorry and we're collecting just over a ton of garden waste that's one tenth of the lorry's capacity and we're paying for it out of overtime and then in terms of the residual waste that's 3.66 tons but of course you could argue that that service is being abused because it's there's furniture and various other things being in, thrown in the back of it which actually means they're not being recycled so from the environmental impact point of view, you could argue actually that's going against the council's own climate change emergency um, resolution, because in effect, we're putting stuff into the ground that should be recycled. So you can also argue that this service is not encouraging recycling because stuff is going straight into the back of a lorry, straight into the ground. Into the ground. Um, and just to answer one of Councillor Young's points, I think he conflated two different services because he was talking about um, a bookable um, bulky um, collection service. This, of course, is just the service where the lorry turns up at a location and people walk or travel to it to um, put stuff in the back of the vehicle. Now, again, from witnessing use of this service, a lot of people drive to it. So again, we talk about environmental impact in the calling that this is going to potentially create more car journeys. And yet we're saying the people that don't use it or sorry, the people that use it don't have vehicles. So that almost sounds like a contradiction. So on the one hand, we're saying it's going to have an environmental impact and increased journeys. But on the, on the other hand, a lot of people drive to it because otherwise, how's somebody going to take a load of garden waste or a big bit of furniture? Because, um, you know, the majority of people are not Sylvester Stallone and can't carry a wardrobe down the street. So it's just worth kind of remembering um, some of those things. Of course, some people will walk, a, you know, a black bag of rubbish. But again, every resident in Colchester has access to the fortnightly black sack collection service. Uh, and again, you know, we collect, you know, 10 to 12 tonnes in the back of those lorries. Um, and we're only collecting 3.06 tonnes, which is one quarter of the vehicle's capacity. So, again, you know, is that a good use of those vehicles on a Saturday morning in that respect? Now, in terms of fly tipping, fly tipping on my watch uh, when we came back into office, not being political, being factual, as I always am. Um, fly tipping has actually gone down um, on previous year on year figures. And um, if asked, I'm sure um, John can provide that. But they actually have gone down. Um, year on year any fly tipping was regrettable and totally unacceptable now of course the other thing you can do with waste is you can actually take it to um, the recycling center with your neighbor or friend you know if if um, if you haven't got a vehicle and people do do that and there are charities that can collect furniture and other items that have ended up in the back of the dust cart so again there are other routes that you can get rid of some of this household waste. The biggest issue now is the POPs legislation under the Environment Act, which will actually increase costs regardless. 
um, because of the fire retardant foam and the fact that you can't just go and um, take a, a sofa to Essex County Council's um, recycling centre anymore. And we didn't have any consulta consultation on that, I'll tell you. Um, they just decided that that we're not going to be um, allowing people to take sofas and things anymore, which then had an impact on our services, actually. So, again, the legislation change has meant that, obviously, um, sofas, and this has come from government, uh, and any pop-related furniture is more difficult to get hold of regardless. And therefore, we would have to pay excess funds to get rid of that if we collect that. That's just another thing to bear in mind. So I think I've probably covered uh, the majority of the calling points and the reason I've had to do this to ask to um, answer the other question. Why did I do any um, uh, negotiation or um, offline conversations? I thought it was better just to do this straight in public to allow the committee to actually hear everything, all the evidence, and I think to make the decision as a committee because I think that's the right approach we talk about good governance but I actually think that it is the if somebody's going to call something in then actually let's hear it out in public let's hear the facts and let's also have it on record so that's why I wanted to make sure it was done in public officially on record all the facts all the conversations um, any points from the panel and then obviously we can look at where we go with this um, and uh, see if there's any suggestions. That's the other valid point. Nobody has come up with any suggestions where the other, if we if we don't withdraw this service, then what else do we cut? Who do, like I said at full council, who do we make redundant? Because that's the hard choice and the facts in such decisions that are always regrettable. Any change of service, any service reduction is always regrettable. And, uh, you know, for that, we have as cabinet members we do have to make those very tough calls sometimes and it is unfortunate regrettable and i'm sorry this decision's had to be taken but we have to and it's also a non-statutory service so again it's not a service that we have to provide the public because we have a curbside collection service that everybody in culture has to have access to so i hope that helps uh, thank you, Councillor Goss. Of course, the, the matter of the budget is not something which we're scrutinising. We've already done that. Um, and we know they're tough decisions. We, we're sympathetic to the, uh, the plight of the Council to balance the books. Uh, it, it is a difficult time. But those are not germane today's uh, hearing. Um, that Those are your personal decisions as a portfolio holder. Um, if I could ask um, a couple of questions. The first is on the consultation uh, with residents. Uh, you stated that because only 1% of the population use this service, uh, then there was um, no significant need to consult. Could you clarify to us what Cabinet's view uh, on the materiality limit uh, is for consultations? I mean, is it a, a policy of the Council that if um, if 1% or less uh, of residents use a service, there should be no consultation. Uh, was it 5%, 10% or is there no policy? Uh, could you just clarify for us, because this to me is the most significant of the call-in issues so that the scrutiny panel can just understand um, the constitution requires consultation. Uh, the, the council prides itself uh, on the way it is open and consults with the residents on decisions. Uh, I think the majority of residents in the, uh, in the city uh, also value that policy that they are consulted and the, the council is very open in the way it, it carries out its decisions. So I'm, I'm interested to sort of drill down uh, to, uh, to the circumstances under which consultation doesn't happen because of a materiality limit. I wonder whether you could just explain to us um, what the facts are in that area. So in terms of the cabinet's view, um, I can't give you uh, the view of the leader of the council or the whole cabinet. So 
I can't um, I can't give you uh, a policy off the top of my head. Uh, I don't know what's in the constitution because I don't have it with me. Maybe um, Richard Block or uh, Owen can talk about what is expected in the constitution or if there is anything documented or not. Um, but that is where we should be looking. The item in the Constitution, I'm sure it's around somewhere. Um, uh, all the Constitution says, as far as I can see, is that decisions should be taken having uh, due regard to consultation. Um, so it's, it's quite open for you to decide um, what is um, the appropriate level of consultation uh, and then it's quite open for the scrutiny panel to come back and ask you to uh, to, to justify it, uh, which I guess is what, what we're trying to tease out at the moment, wh whether 1% is, uh, uh, as a rule, uh, below the level at which one would expect to uh, to, to consult. Uh, but you say there is no policy on, on, in Cabinet on uh, the matter of materiality limits for consultation. So there was strategic consultation um, earlier in the year, on, um, obviously waste, uh, and obviously we're looking at a waste strategy at the moment. Um, and there was uh, workshop feedback that suggested residents were open to a change in waste collections. So obviously this is one of those changes that we've had to make that is driven by budget. Um, but uh, basically, there is no policy of cabinet that I'm aware of. Uh, we would obviously be guided by the constitution, wouldn't we? And if the constitution sounds vague as you've read it out, then it's down to my decision ultimately to make that decision, isn't it? And therefore, if you don't agree with it, um, then obviously that's why we're here this evening. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Lilly, you, uh, you were first in line. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I don't think it was a policy of, uh, of of limitation for that. We did a license in one once, out of all the hundreds of drivers that uh, we asked, we, I think 20 come back. But we still went with those people because that's the consultation. And uh, I think that 1% of people who use it is still worth asking. And there is a consultation to ask those people who use it, whether or not it's 1% or 100%. I'd still like to hear that. Uh, I, I, mean, I agree with Councillor Lismore's uh, point she's made here tonight, and it shows this is not a political decision. This is a decision that a lot of us are not happy with, mainly because... Councillor Lilly, can, can I stop you at this point? The, yeah, OK. Yeah, you, know the, the, you know the scrutiny process. At this stage, we ask oh, questions uh, to, uh, so that we are better <laughs> informed uh, about how this decision was taken. And so at the moment, always, yeah. we're asking questions. Ask, you know, ask about the okay. uh, the percentage of people, or ask about what the uh, the percentage increase in fly tipping will be. And then when we when we've asked well, the questions, that. we will then have a roundtable discussion about what we think about it. You are in my car. Yes. I got one up on you there. Um, okay, right. So um, I do believe that you haven't really considered the consultation process enough and therefore we should ask for that to be looked at again uh, and also with the fact that things have changed a lot with um, the dumps decision to have a booking in process that has changed things significantly and it is going to lead to more fly tipping with the scrapping of of this service especially in, in rural wards like mine, uh, is, we always suffered in the past, but with that uh, freighter service coming in, people do take the, they drive up there, of course, and they do dump off their mattresses and heavy items. Have you considered the cost of to the council of going out every weekend to answer and to pick up all those items that are going to be flight tipped in the coming weeks and months to come. Surely that cost is actually not worth scrapping off the freighter service. Is that okay, Jeff? Yes. 
Well, that's really super, Councillor. Thank you very, very much. <laughs> Councillor Goss. So in terms of fly tipping, um, at this moment in time, for the first three quarters of 22 stroke 23, fly tipping is down in Colchester by 23.8% versus the previous year. So as I said earlier, um, I've got the figures now uh, that has shown a massive reduction. Yes, we have spoken about the potential increase for fly tipping. Um, but in terms of what Essex County Council have done, we are separate authorities. Essex, as I said, had a copy of this proposal. They didn't choose to comment. They didn't choose to say, this is a bad idea. This is going to uh, increase fly tipping on top of the fly tipping uh, we think is going to happen. And interestingly, of course, Suffolk has actually had a booking system since COVID. And it was so successful, they chose to keep it, as I understand it. Um, and in fact, I do recall during COVID, because I was running the waste service then, people were actually asking for a booking service at the actual uh, centres in Essex during COVID. And Essex decided not to do it. They declined and then they were criticised. And now they've put it in and it's been successful in Suffolk. They're being criticised for it. Um, there's a possible loose relationship, you could argue. But on the converse, you look at the user base, as I've said, and the actual tonnage, um, you know, garden waste fills one tenth, if that, of a, of a dust cart. And the residual waste fills possibly a quarter of that dust cart. And as I say, there are um, charities that take some of the stuff that shouldn't be going into landfill anyway for free. Plenty of um, good organisations out there like St Helena Hospice, um, British Heart Foundation, etc., that take furniture and other related items for free that people are chucking in the back of the dust cart. So um, I don't believe it's going to have a massive impact because the audience that this uses, uses this is tiny. And therefore, uh, and also given the items, you could say the system's being abused now because stuff is going in that shouldn't be because we we're pretty um open and tolerant about what goes in uh, into the back of it so i don't believe it's going to have a massive impact but of course it's been discussed um and of course um staff have been spoken to about um you know how many uh people use the service obviously we've got the tonnages and also items going in so you could argue that yes staff have been consulted on um, information while for helping to make this decision. If I could follow on from Councillor Lilly's uh, very valid question. Um, in your decision notice, you said the savings would be 23,500. Did you make any allowance for the extra cost of cleaning up fly tipping? Um, or are you just assuming that that is, is zero? Um, I think you might have got the cost savings wrong. I thought they were 25,369.98 pence or whatever they were, 23,000. So but anyway, um, so we we obviously have uh, looked at um, the potential increase. We don't believe it's going to have a massive impact. And um, we believe that cost saving will be delivered. It will be a physical cost saving because this is either agency staff we're not paying or it's not, um, you know, overtime that's being paid. So, no, I don't believe it's going to have um, a massive increase um, in fly tipping. And we will obviously be pointing people at where else they can actually get rid of stuff legally and other organisations that are um, of low cost that have the right um, licences that, that obviously they can use. So there are other routes to this. Or, as I say, people can get their friend to help them take this to the recycling centre and book in. They could even go to Suffolk if they wish. Uh, my apologies if I got the figure wrong. It was a figure that was shown in the executive summary of your decision notice. Um, but that that may have been last year's estimate rather than, yeah. than the, the I would also, I would, also say, I would also just say that the actual cost, the real cost under the pot 
will actually be £34,200. 34, um, pounds. That will be the actual cost saving going forwards because of the extra cost of getting rid of pop furniture, etc. So I know we can only base it on this current report, but that's actually um, that's actually what the ongoing cost will be. But anyway, so um, let's just clarifying in in your in your assumption and your decision about the the cost savings, you you did not add anything on the negative side for uh, cleaning up increased fly tipping. Uh, because you believe non no, there will be no extra increase in fly tipping. I think, I think I've clearly answered that question. Any more questions, Councillor Lilly? The floor is yours at the moment. Uh, not really. No, just I disagree entirely with Councillor Goss. He believes it won't. I believe it will. And I think the cost is going to be horrendous for us. Yeah. I really do. I think he hasn't. He's mistaken. In our rural areas, he's going to leave that. But um, I've no questions for him. Okay. Councillor Scordis. Thank you, Chair. And um, I am slightly confused about why Councillor Goss didn't mediate with Councillor Lismore. He said he wanted it out in the open. But to me, he could have mediated with Councillor Lismore to have an all members briefing and, and spoken to the press. Um, I imagine what three people are watching online, Owen, probably fewer. Um, so if we're being honest, it's not really to the public, it's just to, to us. And it's actually costing us money because we're using officer time. Uh, we're talking about saving money. So I, I am concerned about that. I think there was another way that could have been dealt with. Um, my quest, main question, though, Chair is on we are looking to charge um, people if they want the service. Um, now, somewhere with a parish council would be able to do that. They probably wouldn't like to, but they'd be able to do that. However, areas in the urban areas that don't have access to a parish council probably don't have a, a, a resident association with a lot of money. How are they going to afford to uh, uh, do this, uh, to purchase this service if they would like to use it for local residents. And I'd also be interested to see if any analysis has been done in um, has the service been used in certain wards more? So has it been used more in a new town rather than an eight ash green with a denser population and different, different demographics and higher rent renters? Uh, thank you, Chair. Councillor Goss. So in terms of how you can fund it, well, Councillor Scordis, you are welcome to use your locality budget to fund it if your residents require it. And that is one of the options that was uh, mentioned in the report, I believe. So you are able to do that um, yourself. And I know previously some ward councillors have uh, funded uh, extra collections. I know it happened in Stanway previously. Councillor uh, Jessica Scott Boutel and I think Les, uh, Leslie funded a, um, a, a collection. So um, yes, that can happen. Um, there is also the possible that some managing agents um, of houses and flats could fund if their residents require it. Um, and uh, we've had Welshwood Park Residents Association fund a leaf collection, which they've been doing for some years, and in fact they funded two. Now obviously they are um, they're a well-funded residents association, properly constituted, um, but some resident associations um, certainly do show interest in it. All councillors have the ability to fund this if they so wish via their locality budget. So yes, there are other routes to this if uh, councillors wish to do that. Councillor Scordis. So I had a second question, Councillor Goss, on if you'd done any analysis on whether the service was more popular in certain areas. Um, so it could have been kept, for example, uh, in an urban or rural area where it was used much more frequently and was to our benefit. So in terms of the um, average, it is 120 customers on average that use it. I don't have the figures with me per location. Um, but I don't know whether Rosa or John have got those to hand. Yeah. 
the answer immediately available from our specialists. Hello, sorry. Um, yes, um, John Kellett uh, is my colleague here who has that data. We do capture the data for the tonnages collected for the different materials from the different locations. We've got that from the past year um, and John can probably give a little bit of an overview if you're there, John. Uh, <clears throat> good evening. Um, so um, we have majority of the data um, for the last year. I don't have the locations, only the dates. Uh, in general terms, the green freighter is very poorly supported by residents. Um, if, if you look at the average uh, tonnage per um, lorry, it's uh, literally uh, a smidge over one ton. Um, on the uh, residual, um, some areas are um, better supported than others, um, but there are still occasions on residual where we are collecting um, about one and a half tonnes, I think is uh, um, several times, in fact, less than one and a half tonnes, some of them. So, so um, it, it does vary by location. Um, I don't have the location dates, only the... Uh, Sorry, the locations against the dates, only the dates. Thank you. That does, is that satisfactory, Councillor Scordis? Uh, yeah, I mean, it is, I'm sure we can figure it out another day because we can see where it was on the dates. But um, yeah, no, that's fine. I mean, there's, there is no suggestion in the, um, in the decision paper that uh, if certain wards should continue with the service uh, because they have a, a relatively high uh, high use of the ward uh, of the uh, the service, um, that, that was that was not part of the decision. Although you can certainly re make a recommendation to that effect uh, if you wish, wish to do, refer the matter back to the uh, the portfolio when we get round to discussing that. Councillor Smith, uh, yes, on that point, you wouldn't be able to do it because the vehicle visits different wards in each day. So you'd only know which the total for the vehicle after it completed it. So it could be the month, the refuge could have come from my ward, your ward, or your ward. We just wouldn't be able to do it. So that data is just not going to be available, unfortunately. Um, so I'm, you know, a little at a loss here to see <laughs> what we could refer back to when it's not going to be possible to do it by ward. Thank you for those most helpful remarks. Yeah, um, that is, uh, I just that just escaped my attention, but uh, it's a, uh, a very good observation. So we're unlikely to be able to get to the uh, uh, figure that uh, the figures that Councillor Scordis was, was was looking for. Are there any more questions that we wish to to bowl at? Uh, uh, Councillor Goss or uh, to Councillor Lissimore, floor's yours if you. Uh... Okay, thank you. So we, we now move on. We, we, we've asked the questions. Uh, we now have a discussion amongst ourselves um, as to how we should um, uh, deal with this particular matter. Uh, the, the, the matter of consultation is a sort of definitive one because either we consult or we don't consult. I suppose there could be you know, half consultation. Consultations, but in general, you, you either do or you don't. Whereas many of the other issues raised by um, Councillor Lissimore, such as the amount of fly tipping, it's a, a matter of opinion as opposed to a matter of fact as to whether there um, there will be um, a, 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 an impact. And, and one would expect those to be dealt with rather differently in the decision uh, report. Uh, but they they are not. Uh, shall we go round um, table and just get a, a feeling for, uh, for for where we should go? I and mean, my my view is that uh, we should certainly refer the matter back on uh, consultation because one percent does seem to be um, you know, a low level, but at times we are providing specialist services for just a few people. 
uh, it, they may be services which are much appreciated or very necessitous for the, the, the recipients of those services. And I'm, I'm unhappy that this should be done purely on a percentage. Uh, if we are to waive the, the, the Constitution's urging of us to, to uh, consult on decisions, there should be a, a greater understanding I think amongst the whole of cabinet, not just Councillor Goss, I mean, there should be some cabinet guidance. Um, doesn't have to be an absolute rule and one tempers it according to the circumstances, but there, there should be some, some policy guidance on um, when consultations can be suspended uh, despite what it says in, in the constitution. And I feel that is an overall point um, which um, which does need clarification and clearly um, was left to the just to the portfolio holder on this occasion. Um, so, Councillor Smith, what are your overall views? Uh, my views are that uh, we should approve this recommendation and I'd like to make that proposal now. Uh, my reasons are that the, um, firstly, that if people objected to this particular saving, they had an opportunity at the budget meeting to move an amendment. The opposition failed to do so. This budget has been approved by council now, and we can't just go back over a budget decision because someone doesn't like it. The consultation issues are at the discretion of the portfolio holder. With the service that's used by so few people it would be very difficult to identify that 1% to consult with. It's not an easily identifiable group like people living in a particular area or what have you. So I see the difficulties in dealing with that. The staff issue has been adequately dealt with. And uh, again, the other issues, again, I think have all been dealt with. If you start wanting every single decision to be subject to a separate consultation, Quite frankly, we're going to be here all day because every decision could then be called in because we hadn't consulted. So I think on balance, this decision meets the criteria and I propose that we approve the decision. Is it seconded? Yeah, and I'll approve that. I think, you know, we have portfolio holders for a reason to make decisions. If we start bringing everything back, it's pointless having a cabinet, it's pointless having portfolio holders. So um, I'm with Councillor Smith on this. Uh, well, I, I disagree. As a portfolio holder, I, I like to go out for consultation. Just imagine Anne and the A boards without actually asking people. It would have been horrendous and suicide for us. And we did that, and it was a great, great comeback that we had in that. And other ones as well. And I believe in democracy. We're often accused by Sir Bob Russell of the cabinet system not not involving the public, not involving backbenchers like us uh, and ordinary councillors. And this is not the only one that we haven't been consulted about. Uh, the other way service that we, we found out in the scrutiny papers and such. So um, I already said that I believe that we should have asked the 1% people who use the service. They are members of the public. They are, we are here to help the members of the public in, in providing services and it's our job to do that. If they have bothered to use the service, we should ask those people there. 1% or 100%, I'd like them all asked. So um, I agree with you, Chair. And Councillor Scordis. I am slightly torn on this. I think Councillor Smith makes a good point that we have had the budget and there could have been an amendment on this. At the same time, I feel this could have been dealt a lot better. There could have been a briefing to members about the changes to waste and it has been thrown on us at the last scrutiny meeting and, and yet again. Um, and along with Councillor Lilly, believe in democracy. Yes, we do have cabinet members to make decisions, but we have backbenchers to hold them to account as well. Uh, so I believe we, we need to refer this back to the member. Councillor Lawson. Very briefly, I mean, in rural North Ward, we've got nearly a dozen parish councils, and I'm not sure 
if um, if um, they were advised that this would be happening, it would be very easy to send parish clerks an email and say this is happening. Are there any views? Because it's not just about the one percent of users; it's about the potential users and anything, frankly, that that can potentially tackle the scourge of fly tipping, particularly in our rural areas where I represent, is something that I know people really care about, and in the urban areas as well. So the matter be uh, approved, and that is sort of um, on the section 1319 of the procedures, A, confirm the decision, which may then be uh, implemented uh, immediately. So I shall put that to the vote. Those in favour? Those against? So that, um, that, that falls. Uh, the two remaining possibilities are we um, we do nothing, well, do nothing, or we refer the matter back to the decision taker. If we do that, we have to have clear reasons why we do so. Um, and the, the first reason that I would like to attach is the matter of the policy on consultation. Um, yes, the matter is um, is up to each individual portfolio holder, but I certainly believe there should be cabinet guidance on on how this should be done. Um, everything that's been said is true. You know, there are there may be times when it's absolutely trivial and it's just not worth a fig. Or, as Councillor Smith was saying, if you can't identify the people with whom you need to consult, it, it may be just a little more difficult than consulting in some other areas. But I do feel that there needs to be a clearer understanding in the mind of the portfolio holders when they take these decisions, what the requirement for consultation is, and when they can just safely dispense with it with the full backing of, um, uh, of cabinet. And it should be a cabinet decision uh, as to, uh, to when, uh, what the policy is in, in, in that area. Um, the, the second issue uh, that, um, uh, that I have is that there, there will be some concerns about the impact of um, of the decision on a, other areas, such as fly tipping. Uh, and if that is so, there should have been a clear explanation in the decision uh, about what the discount would be against the savings. If the discount is zero, fine. If it's been thought through and it's it's clearly it's obvious that there's going to be. Um, the impact is not going to cost anything and it's not going to whittle away uh, at the savings, then that's fine. But that should be stated in the, the decision. Uh, and it was not. And clearly there are um, that there is considerable concern that there may be. And it's a risk. We don't know. We're not certain. It's a, it's a gray area, uh, but it's a gray area which should have been discovered, should have been covered in the decision notice. So the. Um, discount due to other circumstances um, should have been there. Uh, are there any other areas where, where members would like to have uh, record, recorded? Councillor Cordes? I mean, linking to what you said about the fly tipping, I think there was a failure from the cabinet member to address whether there'd been any analysis done of the effect this will have in areas. So it, it feels like this is just service is just being cut to save money rather than actually looking at will it have a, a detrimental effect or will it be a minimal effect i don't think we got a, a, a proper answer on that so i think that's another one to bring back back as well chair so at the moment we have two issues where uh, there is significant concern uh, amongst the panel any other issues uh, the issues raised by in the call in was no consultation and um, we've discussed that no consultation with staff I think that was cleared off fairly well senior staff have been involved the people who do the work um, have also voted with their feet and that they don't want to do it which was a sort of strange but interesting reply from the portfolio holder the increase in fly tipping uh, there should have been more analysis 
um, will affect those who are most vulnerable and do not have access to a vehicle. Um, did we feel that that point was was made? It was one again. It's one of those grey areas. There will be someone who I must admit. I, I in eight ash green. I I take my wheelbarrow round to the uh, the attended freighter. Um, I don't actually use a vehicle. Um, do we feel that this is a, a, a significant issue that we should in, in, incorporate in? in Sorry, Councillor Willits, is it possible that I can just come? Because I do think I have a, a bit of a sort of a solution to this, the way we can move forward. Um, it is difficult to find that 1%, I totally agree. And, and, and if you're um, casting a, a fly out into, you know, no man's land, you're not going to pick up, you know, the big fish that you want to catch. However, if you run this service this year, you, there, there are your 1%. There's the 1% that turn up to actually use it. Now, we do not know the tonnage, okay? And I understand the reasoning behind that, but we know how many people use it. So we can count the, the, the operatives that are there at the freighter can have a clipboard and they can count the number of people that are using it. And then if you think about the fly tipping issue, um, it is a person that fly tips. It's yes, the tonnage matters. It matters how it's collected. We're actually not talking about tonnages here. We're talking about people that will put their rubbish elsewhere compared to on the on the freighter. So I, I would suggest that we can consult those residents that use this service and certainly continue to consult once the charges for the garden waste services have been brought in so that we actually know the impact that that has on the service as well. Uh we, th thank you for those uh, those those remarks, but it is the portfolio holder who has to get his mind around those issues, and it's not the scrutiny panel's job uh, uh, to tell him how to do his job. Um, I mean, we we all we all we all have personal views. If I was portfolio holder, I would do it that way. Yes, absolutely. Um, what we're looking at here is whether the decision was taken correctly, whether the issues, the tangential issues were properly addressed in the decision report. Uh, and then it's down to the portfolio holder. And if you want to talk to him offline about how to do it, fine. But it's not a matter that is really uh, germane to the consideration uh, of the panel. Thank you for those useful words, but um, you know, then they're, they're not appropriately addressed at the moment. Um, uh, yeah, sorry, I don't think it's the same 120 people that use this service every time. Right. It's different people who've got it. So what you're proposing, Councillor Lismore, just will not. And it's, it's, it's not part of our process this evening to solve the problem for the portfolio holder. Much as we're all itching to do so, uh, it's, it's not our process this evening. Uh, we're, we're just here to review his decision, what he did, what he took into account. Um, some of it we support, some of it we find um, not quite what we were expecting. And that is what we, um, we're we doing this evening. Um, we got to the, will it affect the vulnerable who do not have access to a vehicle? Uh, I'm, that's again, one of those gray areas that um, I'm not quite, quite sure how that um how, how did people get to these things in the first place then yeah, when they I, were there it's, it's a non I, I get i take my wheelbarrow so oh sorry um it'll in increase the um uh, the vehicular movements going to the recycling centers yeah. um might do but we have no evidence that 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 is so. Because of the booking system now, I don't think it probably will do actually. <laughs> uh, and that's that's why they'll, if they can't get a slot, and this is why I'm arguing about um, the, the fly tip and stuff, so. And we'll increase domestic waste collection services. Well, yes, perhaps they'll put their, their stuff that they would have taken to the uh, attended freighter and put it in their black bags, but we have no evidence uh, at all.
So do we, do, we, do we feel strongly enough to add anything else to our recommendation back to the portfolio holder about other than the policy on consultation, which will be a cabinet wide decision um, and the failure to analyze the impact on the fly tipping and um, those are, those seem to be you know, round the table. Yeah. Those seem to be the two salient features which were um, definitely uh, lacking in this particular decision. I mean, we can we can argue the grounds on some of the other grey areas, but they they don't have the strength which which those two have. So can I propose that we uh, that the option we choose is 1319B, which is to refer the decision back to the decision taker for further consideration, setting out in writing the nature of our concerns. And our concerns are um, the policy on consultation is not clear enough, not just on this decision, but in general. Uh, and there was insufficient analysis of the effect of this decision uh, on other environmental factors such as fly tipping. That's seconded. Any further discussion on that matter? Can I put that to the vote? All those in favour? Or all those against? Two. So we... You, you have... Uh, yes, Mr Chairman, I've made a note of that, so I'll type those up formally and uh, th those will go forward. Uh, to the uh, portfolio holder who can then either accept the recommendations or if he does not re accept the recommendations, they'll go forward to cabinet uh, consideration at the next cabinet meeting. Thank you. That takes us on to item nine. Uh, items requested by members of the panel. Um, none have been brought forward in advance. Uh, and that brings us to the end of the agenda. <laughs> Can I thank you for turning out on a on a Friday night uh, beyond the call of duty, colleagues? Uh, but it was um, it was necessary. Thank you, Councillor Lissimore, for attending this evening and raising these issues for us. And um, thank you, Councillor Goss, for being uh, so helpful. Sorry we ruined your evening, um, but, but thanks all the same. That's very enjoyable, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, I declare the meeting closed.